Hello, Tom Levecki here with the latest edition of the Armchair NBA. Actually going to be my last broadcast for the year. I'm going to wrap it up in style. Have my man, Gunnar Lindblom. We're going to talk a little bit about differences between the Detroit, uh, Detroit mob and New York mob and some other things as he's doing as an entrepreneur. Gunnar Lindblom, welcome to the Armchair NBA. How are you doing today, buddy? Yeah, good to be back, man. Thanks for having it's me. My, it's my pleasure. So I want to start off, okay, so... People know Gunner. Most people know Gunner. For those that don't, we'll put a link below. He has a great story related to some royalty over in Detroit Mob. But I want to give a quick background to set up the Detroit Mob structure. Give us about how the, the partnership of Detroit Mob started and give us a little context and the background uh, how the Detroit Mob uh, initiated. Okay, so I'm just for the record, I'm no expert, but my, my, my yeah. good friend Scott Bernstein is literally, literally the expert on the Detroit Mafia. I wrote the book yeah. Motor City Mafia. He is the expert, did a two-hour documentary on the Detroit Mafia, Detroit Confidential. Check it out. Um, so I only am an expert on my personal experiences in yeah. and around it. What I do know, based on and I, a lot of this stuff, man, the thing is, growing up, there were so many little pieces of the puzzle that I didn't really know, and I didn't yeah. really – wasn't able to connect the dots until literally um, when I was in prison. This is actually a good, good story. I'll get quickly to it. When I was in prison, a guy came – matter of fact, I got the book right here. Yeah. The guy comes up to me off the yard. My bunkie runs in. I was in prison, about seven, eight years in the prison. And my cellmate walks in and goes, look at this book. I got it off the yard. I paid eight bucks for it, man. I got it for you. I said, it's called Motor City Mafia. It's about your family. And I was like, I don't want that book. He's like, well, just give me the eight bucks. I'm like, I'm not paying eight bucks for that freaking book. I mean, <laughs> to me, Tom, this was like sacrilegious. Like, I, yeah, I, my yeah, hands yeah. would catch on fire. If I, if I, I think yeah, yeah. all my life, you have all these secrets that you keep from everybody and everywhere. And, everywhere, and suddenly some douchebag writes a book about it and publishes it. I'm just like, whoa. But my bunkie, his name was Ed Burley. He was a good dude. I felt bad. So I gave him the money for the book and I threw yeah. it in my locker and I kind of flipped through it, saw names and faces. Yes, everybody I know, old timers. Then I didn't touch it again for like four or five years. And then I rode into a prison at, called Macomb Prison. There was an old uh, wise guy there named Dago Tone, Anthony yeah. Cerullo. You can look him up. He's the only guy who's ever been convicted of murder for the Detroit mob. And they couldn't even like say for sure it was a mob murder. It was murder. Yeah. He was a hitman and a made guy. But, um, He's involved in the Taco Bowman uh, assassination attempt. That's the head of the outlaw bikers you may be familiar yeah. with. Yeah, that was his boy. And so he's an old dago from the old country, and we're sitting there talking, and he speaks Sicilian like my grandpa. He was kind of broken. Yeah. And uh, we start talking, became good friends, and I said, you know, I got that book. So he pulled, I, he, I pulled the book, so he started going this, that, that. So what he starts doing is connecting all these dots. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that really makes sense. sense. That makes sense. Oh, I see now, I see now. But nobody connected all the dots till after I got out of prison, and I published my books. And when I was publishing my books, I did a short story series called The Limbloom Chronicles. It's like 21 yeah. short stories about my life before prison and the family growing up, whatever. And yeah. Scott Bernstein said, hey, I'd like to carry those. He messaged me. I emailed him and he called me and he said, yo, I'd like to carry those. I know who you are. Uh, I heard about you. I asked around. I did my homework. You know, I confirmed who you are. He's like, I'll carry them. And then he started carrying these Limbloom Chronicles. He's like, bro, I get like 12,000 hits a day on them things. They're, they're, they're gold. And I'm oh, like, well, wow. use them all you want. What and were they so, about exactly? Just short stories about my life in the streets. Yeah. I and mean, I kind of chronicle chronologically the, my introduction into that life around 14 years old. Um, I expelled from school at 15 years old. My uncle caught me selling weed. He said, yeah, if you're going to sell weed, you're going to sell good weed. And he, he said, give yeah. me 10 pounds of weed. He says, now you sell for me. And then yeah. it just was this, trans, this uh, transition. Uh, yeah, yeah. I wrote 21 of these stories. But, you know, I've told 100 of them on my YouTube show, at least 200 of them. You know, some are bigger than others. Some barely even mob connected. Some are very mob connected. Yeah. But anyways, that's how Scott Bernstein and I had sat down. And, and he's like, so my grandfather... Um, his first cousin was Jack Toko, the boss, right? And I knew that, but I just didn't know the connection of how. One of the reasons why was because every time I would say, Grandpa, who's my great grand my great grandfather, he would get very like reticent and quiet and like wouldn't want to talk about it. It was weird, you know, he wasn't that kind of guy. And my grandfather or my grandmother would say, Leave it alone, leave it alone. Well, his father, all right, was a guy named Joe to uh, Joe Toko. Yeah. They call him the uh, the beer man of Down River, whatever. He's a famous like bootlegger, you know, from this prohibition. And his brother was William Vito Toko, the the boss who would go on to be the boss. But my great grandfather yeah. was murdered in like 1933, oh, while wow. Vito William Vito Toko was in prison. So when I'd asked my grandpa about it, he wouldn't talk about it. Wouldn't nothing. And Scott says that's your great grandfather, and the reason that your grandfather doesn't want to talk about it is because there was a great amount of animosity towards. 
my grandfather towards William B. Otoko because when he got out of prison, he didn't kill the guy who killed your grand great grandfather. In fact, he put him to work for him. And I said, well, why? And he said, there was a lot of business at play, but to be perfectly honest, from what, in, what I learned, your great grandpa was a douchebag. He was cheating on freaking, he was, he was sleeping with other people's wives. He was being greedy and he got the green light to go and his own cousin or his own brother had said, go ahead and kill him. And anyway, so I didn't know that until after Scott Bernstein. So anyways, moving forward, his, my, my grandfather's first cousin was Jack Toko, which would be William Beatle to Yakimo would be his, his first cousin or William Beatle's son. And he kind of, took over in my lifetime when I was young, I was baby. About the time I was born, he took over as the boss. Yeah. And I knew him growing up as just Uncle Jack, even though yeah. technically he's a cousin, you know what I'm saying? He's my grandfather's- and Meanwhile, he's a whale in the life, you know? Yeah, he's a whale. And, and you know what? I sensed that too. All my all my years growing up, I kind of sensed he was the whale. Everybody kind of just the way they treated him, talked to him. But here's the interesting thing. I've never really yeah. talked about this. And I'd be happy to tell you. Please. Um. So, you know, so- Everybody knows who Tony Jackaloni is. So Tony Jackaloni's daughter married my cousin, or my mother's yeah. first cousin, which would make him yeah. my second cousin. I'm not yeah. going to say his name because he's around. Yeah. He's not the nicest guy. So, I mean, I don't know. He seems kind of a dick. You know, but <laughs> anyways, he, so Tony Jack was very friendly. Tony Jack ran all the gambling in the city. All of it. All of it. If you, you had a sports book, you paid. You kicked up to Tony. He was yeah. protecting you. He was getting you books. He was laying off your bets. He was whatever. So my grandfather was a huge layoff book. He worked with Tony. And so Tony Jack because his daughter married my cousin he, he yeah. came around a lot and when i was young i didn't really know who the freak he was it's one of my uncles i had a freaking yeah. i had literally had like you know all my old uncles were wise guys they're all yeah. you know gangsters all of them and there was none that really stood out as more than anything except jack jack toko yeah. you knew he was the boss because Correct. he would come along over and he'd be alone and if he wasn't alone everybody would leave and leave with my grandpa to talk alone they'd go oh, in the wow. back room they'd speak in sicilian they might sit back there watch a football game um whatever for an hour or two whatever and then they come out and they leave then when i got older of course my uncle pete my mother's brother peter toko started schooling me to who's who and he told me you know uncle jack's the boss and i'm like yeah. what i mean i kind of suspected but and then he told me Tony's a street boss. Uncle Tony's a street boss. Well, hold on, yeah, one really quick because the reason we're gonna talk about New York versus versus uh, Detroit. One of the things Detroit always done well is basically three families: the Tocos, the Jacalones, and um and uh, Zarelli. And it was kind of like a boss street boss, and they kind of perfected it. So continue. Yeah, so the street boss really was the the face of the, the Detroit mob. I was always yeah. kind of shocked and amused when I'd meet people, random people who didn't really know my history, nothing like that. And they'd, yeah. maybe they'd talk about the mob and they're like, yeah, you know who the mob, you know who the boss is? You know, I'm like, yeah, who's that? And they're like, you know, Jack Loney, Tony Jack Loney, Vito Jack Loney. And I'm like, no, nah, he's not the boss. Oh, no, no, yeah, he is. I'm like, no, no, the family, <laughs> it, it's called the Toko Zarelli crime family. The boss is Yakimo, Jack Toko. Um, Jack or, or Tony Jack's just a street boss. Well, no, I'm not gonna argue with him. I'm just like, okay, yeah. you're right. But you know, it's people they were the they were the, the junkyard dogs of the Detroit mob. They were the face. They were the tough guys. They were the yeah. wet workers. The guys who got it in. I know. I mean, I believe uh, Scott Bernstein said that Tony was suspected of, of uh, up to 50 murders, including Tony uh, wow. um, uh, Jimmy Hoffa. So I mean, wow. but I didn't I didn't see him like that. I mean. When he got out of prison, I don't know what I was. I was like 14 years old. He started coming around a lot. And um, he knew every step of my walk as a young criminal and all that because I lived with my grandparents. And he was going bodies with my grandpa. So he'd come yeah. over. And here's where I yeah. think this is where the connection happens. Yeah, He'd come over and, and then he'd leave. They'd talk in Sicilian. Lots of times my grandpa, he would like leave a gift of meat. He'd bring it from the market downtown. Yeah. Here's some deli meats and some stuff blah blah blah, blah for for, yeah. for mama he'd take it in the room whatever and then literally hours later jack toko would come over and i yeah. started connecting the dots going okay every time tony comes jack comes and then they go for a sit down for a while and then my grandpa would say before you go goodbody let me give me this box of bananas or this box yeah. of fruit or this blah 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 and he'd give him of course in that box was money somebody was yeah. giving money that was probably tribute from tony's you know whole operation i don't know and the other thing was sometimes tony or jack would come over and it was like, you know, I was a kid. I was a teenager, yeah. so I didn't really pay much attention. I, I was in and out of the house, coming and going, chasing girls, selling dope and drugs and doing everything that I did. But so I didn't see, I wasn't always there. But about maybe once every couple of weeks, I'd see them there. 
And yeah. my uncle, my grandfather's eyes started to go bad when I was 19, 20. I just got out of jail. I just yeah. did six months in the county jail. So the whole family knows I just got out of jail. And I'm just a bad kid, expelled from school, always fighting. I got like five felonies by the time I'm 20 years old. I'm already got five yeah. felonies. And so my gra- I said, Grandpa, your eyes are bad. You're going to smash up three cars. You're going to kill somebody blowing red lights. And I said, you got to go see your bodies. I'll drive you. So he yeah. says, okay, I'll drive. So I'm driving them. And of course, it would be Jack Toko would come over. And then two hours later, Oh, come on, we go to the market, and then we drive. He would go talk in Italian and tell whatever it was that Jack wanted to be told. He would relay it to his younger, his older cousin, my grandpa. That was they grew up three blocks away from each other. Their whole life, sixty-five years, they lived in the, in the same freaking neighborhood. I went to the same schools. Kids went to the same schools. Grew up together. Every wedding, every everything. So they were very close. Um, they're only. My, my my grandfather was 11 years older than Jack. So I imagine Jack Toko kind of looked up to my uncle, my grandpa a yeah. lot, a little bit, because he was a yeah. very revered, kind of nice guy that everybody loved. Yeah. And I don't think my grandpa was ever going to be made, because I, I this is my theory, I don't think he would kill anyone. I don't think he had it in him. So they just said, you know, you can be a bookie, yeah. you can do what you want, but you, you don't need yeah. to get a button, you know, to be to do what we want. Your family, that's that. Yeah. And, I don't know. But, but so, you're, 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 bring, oh, really quick, you're bringing up some, I want to, Give the architecture. So number one is um, one thing is I understand about the Detroit mob. It's very Sicilian. So the closing oh, as we know mafia yeah. is Sicilian, but in New York you had a lot of Calabrians, a, a yeah, lot yeah. of Napoletan, and it kind of gets mixed. Where 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 Detroit kept it very Sicilian. The other thing, exactly. The second thing is, and and, and very old school Sicilian mob is a lot of people married each other. So I noticed you said, mm-hmm. hey. Somebody married my cousin, somebody married, et cetera. I think Profaci's two um, daughters married, I think two Tocos, was it? Uh, Profaci's, I think... I a Scott. We had a Scott. Two, Profaci's yeah. two daughters married two people from the Detroit mob. So you kind of might have been at... um, Tony Toko's daughter. I can't remember it either, man. But yeah, yeah. Profaci's married into the family. and they. Were, but I, if I remember correctly, like one's daughter married one son and one son married one daughter. I, I, think, maybe I, think, I, think, I think that was it. And remember, now you talk about like the, the Colavita Empire. There's, there's a lot going on, right? So you look at mostly Sicilian, family marrying family, having the structure, almost like the Genovese family of having the, the, the street boss and stuff. But the next thing that kind of stands out, stands out for me for Detroit is um very low informant rate i think only one who was it i think i i, I my research showed only one informant yeah, in no, the history of the detroit mob so how, how do they have less informants and walk us through that well here's the thing so you nailed it within terms of the way that the family there's a couple things i'm gonna break them down yeah please so, co- co- so the, the term the family structured in a way like an old sicilian clan back from the old country everybody knows everybody everybody's family now it's probably about seven families um and if you read my novels in my novels i think i have five but it's a fictional book so it's just, i kind of loosely based it inspired by you know real life but anyways so you got like seven families and then there's some satellite families everybody kind of knows everybody the people who are supposed to know know they're just they know since birth everybody knows who's mob connected and who's not most of the family when i was growing up all lived in gross point michigan a very wealthy enclave that was you know, ballers, all ballers live within like a five block radius, maybe 50 made dudes or whatever. The whole, the whole, everybody lived there. And everybody's friends with everybody, went to their weddings and kids and funerals and blah, blah, blah. So they keep it very, very close. The the sons, I mean, the, the, the old men say, I'm going to marry my daughter to your son and my son to your dog. And we're going to solidify the family and make us stronger that way. Why? Because if somebody, if somebody gets pinched and is facing a bunch of time, they're far less apt to rat if it's actually family. Give you a perfect example. Myself. When when I got arrested, and uh, the very day I got arrested, the very hour I was arrested, the feds came in and said, you know, you can walk today. You can go sleep with your fiance tonight if you want. I'm like, yeah, well, how's that? And he's like, you know, and he showed me pictures, FBI surveillance pictures. Like, what happened this day? And what is this and that and that? And I said, yeah, get me a lawyer, man. I, 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 just, I don't know nothing about it. He said, you're going to do a lot of time, 30, 40 years. And all I could see in my mind was my grandparents, my, my, my grandfather, the look on his face. If he would have had to go see who's bodies and they were going to look at, he'd walk into a room of these, like a back room of a warehouse or a, a car lot, wherever it's Gumbadis, they all hung out, played penny poker or whatever. He'd walk in and they'd all look at him and go, this mother effer is the freaking, you know, the, the grandfather of that rat weasel freaking gunner who, who ratted us all out. I, I couldn't live with it. So I decided. 
I'll kill myself in prison. I just said, I'll kill. If they give me 30 years, I'm not doing 30 years. I'll exhaust my legal remedies. I'll try to appeal it. I'll do whatever. And then if it don't work in 10, 12 years, I slip my wrist in the shower or do some dope and I'm out. And, that, and that's it. Well, I feel like most of the Detroit family guys would rather face that music than disgrace their family. They'd rather just, you know, I'd rather die than disgrace my family. Um, There was one weasel. And you, you, you also talked about how there's like three factions. You're yeah. right. So there's the Toko faction, which really the Toko faction, it's the Toko Zarelli crime family, right? And that's because yeah. it was started by Uno Zarelli and William Vito Toko. And they handed it down to their sons. Well, this, uh, the uncle handed down his nephew, Jack Toko, the, instead of his son because his son got busted in the casino skim in Vegas and humiliated him. He was on the commission. You know, the, uh, Uno Zarelli was on the commission of the mafia, yeah. the national yeah. commission. And yeah. his son gets busted skimming $4 million from the Frontier Hotel in Vegas and humiliates him. And makes him look like a national freaking buffoon. So he demotes him and says, you're demoted. Your cousin's now the boss. If he oh, wants wow. to give you a job, you can be the boss. You, whatever. So out of reciprocal, Jack Toko said, listen, cousin, no, you've been my best friend all my life. I'm going to name you the underboss. Well, he thought uh, uh, um, Tony Zarelli hated that. He this was he, he hated. He, said, he thought he should have been the boss. And for the next freaking 12 years, they were at each other's throats. And they hated it. And they didn't, didn't get along. And it got to the point where... Jack Toko said, you can run your family. You're like a little satellite crew. You're Zarelli yeah. guys on your own, however you want. I'll stay out of your business. You got to report to me on major moves or whatever, but just do you or whatever. So you had now the Jackaloni crew was the street. They were the guys who ran drugs, gambling, yeah. prostitution, muscle extortion, all that. Yeah. They were the, the badasses of the, of the family, but they still were loyal yeah. to Jack Toko. If Jack Toko said jump to Tony uh, Jackaloni, Tony Jack said, ha, hi, that's it. Correct, correct. And no, even though the, uh, the gangster out of the two by far was Tony Jack Loney, correct, the real correct. gangster was Tony correct. Jack Loney, and, and, and Jack Toko knew that. But but Tony Jack, Tony Jack Loney was the driver for Uno Zarelli, and he was trained yep. Costa Nostra by a Don, right. by a godfather. The same bloodlines, yep. Exactly. And everything he said, this is my wishes. You understand, Tony? My wishes are to have my nephew be the boss. And he makes the calls because he's a smart guy. If he makes a call, you follow them orders just because I believe in him. He's a smart guy. And Tony Giacalone, even though he probably felt like, you know, I'd make a better boss, which he wouldn't have. But but he would have made it. He's a better gangster. But yeah. so he he honored that the, the call of his Don. And, th and that was that. So you had the Zarelli crew here. And then you had the Toco and Giacalone crew here. And really, the Jack Loney, the, the Toko crew, were, they didn't really have their hands deep in any street racket. Yeah, but here's the thing. The Toko crew, the Toko, the, the three or four Tokos that I read, one had partnerships with Castellano, and yeah, oh yeah. I think their family's worth north of like $100 million. $100 million. They got involved with, big, again, big differences, right? Racketeer versus gangster. The Detroit yeah. mob got in in the infrastructure yeah, the the fabric of society, exactly. right? Exactly. So walk us a little through about how the Tokos kind of mix business with crime, and the Jackalones were, were respectfully more of the gangster types. So yeah, push a little through the deeper. street. So so yeah. that's a great that's a great. I mean, it's, I'm glad you're smart. It's the whole reason I, I look forward to this talk with you because me too, um because you're a smart guy and, and you kind of see how it works. So yeah. the, Detroit is is really good at what um what I call cultivating assets cultivating an asset so what they do is and i've seen this done my, my uncle sal toko was a perfect example i probably should have yeah. said his name because my cousin watches this his son Oops. sorry kid um not i've never said it before but what happens is they pay for him to go to school and then he went to school and he got a job working for the irs that's where they yeah. wanted him working for yeah, the irs so he's in the irs the irs now and and all their infinite wisdom has has access to all the federal databases who's being looked at for what in terms of tax evasion yada 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 so now my uncle a wise guy for his name is his sal toko is literally working for the irs feeding information so what they do is they they'll take a guy maybe your son He's a, you're a yeah. straight shooter, clean cut, whatever. Your son, maybe you don't have enough money to pay for law school. So they, he says, listen, I'll pay for your kid to go to law school, right? Yeah. Oh, you really, you would do that? Yes, I, I'll do that for you because I got the money. And they sure. say, all I ask, maybe that someday, it was just like a mob movie or something. Maybe someday, you know, he does me a favor. That's all I ask. So yeah. now fast forward, he graduates law school. He says, hey, why don't you, the, the, you know, his handler and the mob says, why don't you run for a uh, prosecutor? We'll help you get voted. We got the unions. We get the unions yep. behind you. We got, you know, people who get you voted in as prosecutor. Yep. Yeah, I love that. You know, now if any one of our guys kind of face you, kind of, you know, find a technicality, you know, help it go yeah. away. 
But then five years later, like, hey, why don't you run for judge? And they're like, uh, okay, we'll pay for your campaign. We'll we'll pay help the you know, the the unions. We'll do it, yep. and they'll get that judge. Next thing you know, you got a sitting circuit court judge up there who who can make it go away. My grandfather, when I got busted selling steroids when I was seventeen years old, my grandfather went and met the judge and handed him ten grand and and said, "I don't want my grandfather, or my grandson, going to prison over this." Um, and he says, you know, Mr. Tokal, I'll make sure he doesn't. And I ended up getting six months in the co- uh, county jail work release, <laughs> but I got kicked out of the work release. And so I ended up doing like four or five months in the county jail. But anyways, so one of the things that they do, like you're, you, you alluded to, is they've woven themselves into the fabric of the culture or society in Detroit. Yeah. So everybody who's on the hierarchy of Detroit, the big business Shot callers, the ballers, Correct. billionaires, Correct. millionaires. Correct. Uh, Correct. They all know who's who in the mob. Correct. And they also know if they want to make moves, they have to uh, cozy up to them because yeah. votes, unions, uh, um, what do you, like, when you need a you need a license, if you need a, you know, um, a permit, you yeah. know, to build a hotel, if you need a license to build you know, a liquor license, yeah. whatever, you all you have to kind of go to one of these well, guys. I, I remember a story. It's funny. Out of all your stories on your, your podcast. I think it. I think it was uh, either it was watching you on another show or on your show where some guy got like a lunch a lunch contract for like the schools and That's your my uncle grandpa. like hooked him up and it was like a half million dollars like some, like for a lunch contract I'm like how many yeah, apples no, are you gonna that, sell that but was that's my how grandpa it that was my grandfather my grandpa Peter Toko owned Toko Produce for forty years and for forty years he maintained that contract now people ask me how does your grandpa keep that contract for Wayne County Schools. All of Wayne County schools, that's Gross Point, Detroit, Dearborn, yeah. all these. How did he keep that contract for 40 years? I look at him and go, are you serious? I said, all it takes, it's his cousin walks up to the freaking city comptroller at a freaking party and says, listen, my my yeah. cousin, you know, gets this contract, right? Of course, Mr. Toko, that's that. Of course, of course, what happens is my grandpa gets the contract. He makes two, three, four hundred grand in a year. He goes over to Jack Toko and says, here you go, Jack. Merry Christmas. He hands him an envelope for with a hundred thousand bucks, and Jack Toko goes over to the comptroller and says, "Here's your 50. And now imagine if he's got a hundred things going like that. There's a yeah. hundred different guys got contracts for yeah. everything: sanitation removal, garbage, bridge construction, road repair, blah 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 blah. It goes on and never stops. So what they do, and then again they control the unions, the Teamsters, the uh, you know the uh, UAW, United Auto Workers Unions, yeah. hundreds and hundreds of thousands of votes. And if yeah. they want somebody in office, a mayor, a mayoral candidate, if they want to city councilman whatever they just put the word out this is our guy get him in and when that guy gets there who yeah. do you think he's handing contracts to you you hit you hit the nail on the head because um it's not about it's not about getting the senator or the or even the the no. congressman it's, it's about getting the state senator it's yeah. about getting the state controller it's about yeah. getting the local mayor because those exactly. guys have juicy contracts as well okay Big. so we're doing a parallel versus new york we could agree probably we'll give new york we're being generous here to the mid 90s right where they were formidable after that kind of fell off a cliff why did detroit continue to, to increase stable of the radar screen still be strong why new york faltered right we could blame giuliani we could blame joe pistone there's a few different things that we could unpack there but how did detroit avoid that decline well, in your opinion you touched on a couple of them Juni Allen, giuliani pistone but really if you really want to trace it back to one person it's it's john Gotti and sammy the bull whatever yeah, that yeah. whole debacle right there and by the way jack toko hated john Gotti because uh, paul <laughs> castellano was his goombati that was his boy they used to, right, used to go right. out there and see him every year he'd go to the white house all that oh wow you know my grandpa would tell me stories but here's what they would do um differently Here's the main reason. This is, I'm just a theorist here, right? like, yeah, like anybody else. I'm, I'm not an expert here. Um, yeah. This is my theory based on my intimate inside knowledge of, of that family and how it works. But, you know, you, you, you're you familiar with the Ritz-Carlton hit. We just talked about it. Before. You know, but I want, but you got to share because it it's one of my favorite stories, man. Okay, let me give you an idea of the power and the depth and the magnitude of the Detroit Mafia's reach in this world. Yeah. Try to grab this because it's going to sound like it's fiction and it's going to sound like it ain't real, but it's real. Yep. So there was a black dude who was cultivated an asset by Tony Jacaloni, the guy I was just talking about. He liked blacks. He liked to cultivate them and, and put them in the drug game, supply them with heroin, and say, yeah. you know, he basically made black mafia family. Literally, that's yeah. who it yeah. was with Bill Usher yeah. and his yeah. black mafia. So the one you're watching now on, on Stars was created by Tony Jack, and you can trace that back. Yeah. So there was this black uh, there was this black dude named Fiona something another. Um he was dealing with a Jewish guy who was a middleman for Tony Jack. So there was Tony's up here. The next guy down was this 
Jewish dude, and and he was running this Fionis guy's drug ring. So the FBI pulled over this Fionis guy. He's kind of a pretty boy, and he's kind of famous because he, he had already married, like, one judge, and now he's married to a different judge. So I guess he's a player. Yeah. So they put pull him aside and says, listen, we know what you're doing. You're going to go to prison. We, we don't have an indictment on you yet, but we're going to get one. So you have a yeah. choice. You can tell. You can work with us, or you can go to prison. Make your choice. And he kind of said, well, I don't want to go to prison. He's like, okay, so what is it going to be? And the witness protection? And they're like, he's like, yeah, we'll put you in witness protection. He says, okay, listen, I got hundreds of thousands of dollars on the street. I got to go chase some money around. I need a couple of days. And they're like, okay, well, we're going to stay with you. You know what I mean? So they stayed with them a couple of days and he runs around chasing them, getting his orders and fair affairs in order. Meanwhile, as they're getting, follow this closely while he's, getting his orders and in, in, uh, his fares in order, yeah. they're in custody of him, right? He is brought to a hotel, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, yep. in which, on this day, down in the in the ballroom is the, yep. a party being held by Tony Giacalone for his 40th anniversary party. Essentially, the entire Detroit Mafia is there. My grandparents, yeah. my mother might have been there. So the whole, yeah. the whole thing, they're all downstairs in the basement, Correct. right? So now... They he they arrange Tony Jack arranges for the FBI to bring this witness who's going to cooperate and testify against them to this hotel, and then during the party, there's two agents there say, "Hey, listen, we gotta leave for a minute. The next detail will be here in about ten minutes. Just you'll be fine. You, your girl, and your kid, just hang tight. You'll be good." The detail walks out of here, and in comes walking an assassin team. They slit his throat. They put a bag over the the wife's head and the kid's out, slit his throat, take his bag, walk out, and then, of course, the the FBI team shows up 10 minutes later to a massacre. They arranged with using the FBI to bring this rat in so they could kill him. And imagine the dirt and the egg that is on the face of the FBI facing this. This is an informant about to testify, not really against even the mob guy himself, but an associate of the mob guy's. And they are under, like, they're they're charged of protecting the mother effort. And Correct. they leave him for 10 minutes, they slit his throat, whatever. It's a terrible scene. But this is so, a good example. So watch. So, so you're talking, you're talking infrastructure. You're talking the yeah. fabric of law enforcement, judges, exactly. uh, prosecutors. Yeah. Uh, another thing is I noticed, because I, I used to actually work in, in Michigan a little bit, Bloomfield Hills and, and other areas. And um, there's a large Chalde- Chaldean population. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. understand also the Detroit mob. Work would also them. work with these guys oh, and yeah. feed them resources because sure. it's all about it's all about you know you know this combat multipliers right yeah. i can go ahead and try to make 20 guys i may have informants i may have this i may have that or i can make five guys and those five guys can manage the chaldeans yes, who are happy exactly. to make money who will take care of the street stuff but we're the real power behind them so talk exactly. about the chaldeans so I, was, I always find that interesting too well, the Chaldeans, okay, so that's a funny story, too. I, uh, what I was getting at, by the way, with the Fiona story is the fact yeah. that whenever somebody has sat down the proffer, you can, we, me and Scott Bernstein did a mob murder timeline on my YouTube channel, yeah, um, yeah. 11 parts. And so we can, you can trace it back. Every single time someone has sat down the proffer, like this Fiona's guy, said, I agree to cooperate or I'm going to cooperate, or there's even a rumor that he might cooperate, that guy either ends up missing dead or overdosed within days wow. every one of them now you could trace this back like 40 years so it's one after another and this is why you don't have rats in detroit that's why you just don't have the cooperators they look at the track record say every time someone sat down the proper they end correct. up dead missing in a trunk whatever so correct but the chaldeans so one thing i'll say is this so the detroit family yeah. mafia was a curse word in my house by the way you couldn't say it i said yeah, it one yeah, time yeah. And almost got slapped so I, even when yeah, i go to say it i'm like Mah! and i still don't yeah, like saying yeah. it but so <laughs> the, the mafia in detroit is very white collar so they're, yeah. they're not a bunch of tough guys not a bunch of street guys the only yeah. guys left even my generation for the most part were um like mob royalty they're born yeah, to their yeah. uncles and, fa- and their fathers and cousin there and they're not tough guys they're not in the yeah. street knocking people out they're not smashing right. people not robbing people they're not but so, nor do they need to that that's the difference no. in detroit and new york keep going exactly yeah. So, so with me, I was a kind of a rare commodity because Tony Jack found through, through trial and error, I guess with me, yeah. gave me a couple tasks that I would hurt people, that I would do it. I had smashed a, a couple of people bad for him. One day it was over a girl and I went, went smashed this freaking dude's face in for him. And, and the girl told him, he's like, this freaking guy just pulverized whoever, you know, my ex-husband. <laughs> and anyway, so they, they liked me as an asset. But, so when they didn't have 
they didn't always have me. I was just one guy, you know, we got a whole right. mom family and I didn't want to do a lot of the stuff anyways, which they wouldn't ask because I didn't want to do it. But what they did have is Chaldeans as muscle and they did have bikers. So they had the outlaw bikers, the highwaymen bikers, and they had the Chaldeans. So if they need muscle, like you said, instead of having 50 made guys, they got eight made guys or the total family was probably at the, at the time, 25, 30 made guys. Um, today it's probably more like 20, 25. Yeah. I don't know. But those guys control – here's the thing. Every single one of these made guys had a – let's say they have a crew of probably 10 guys, all yeah. right? And every one of those 10 are likely about kind of like what I was. Had, yeah. And I had my own crew of like five, yeah. six, seven scumbags yeah. who sold drugs, robbed, stole, beat, extorted, yeah. whatever. So if you got – you know, you got 25 guys, each you have 10. And each one of those 10 guys have five or six guys. Correct. Now you're Combat talking multiply. two or 300. Correct. Correct. Two or 300 guys got their hands in everything from gambling, the strip. Yeah. The strip programs, the F- drugs, it don't matter. Some like my crew was notorious for robbing drug dealers. If they weren't mob associated, we were coming for you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that's where the Chaldeans, but Tony Jack, <laughs> Tony Jack one time had a Chaldean bookie um, who wasn't paying his mark because I don't know, they had a long standing feud because the guy didn't pay him for months and then he finally won. And now the guy wants his money. And he's so, anyways, he calls Tony and says, This for Chaldean won't pay me my money. And he knows the book he's under Tony, Al Hilf, which is Al Hilf means Tony. And so he calls me, he says, Go convince this freaking guy. I'm not going to say his name in the book because he's still alive. He said, like, Convince him to pay up his mark. He owes the guy 20 G's. I'm like, Well, what am I supposed to do? He's like, I don't know. Whatever you do, just use finesse because the Chaldeans are, are hot headed. He said they like to fight and you got to use finesse. And I'm like, This is coming from Tony Jack. So I'm like, <laughs> If Tony Jack is telling me to use finesse with yeah. these motherfuckers, then the Chaldeans must be respected. I did yeah. know that. And um, and they should be. They, and, they, and they should be. But they were definitely um, an extension in terms of muscle and 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 the threat like like threat of violence and they were connected to a lot of the community too they owned a lot of businesses uh yeah. restaurants liquor stores gas stations and they all kind of paid tribute it all kind of kicks up and um and they all help each other everybody helps so each other. so hold on so so uh, the, 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 i would say the final part we talked about again sicilian heritage uh uh organization being the fabric cultivating assets and then partnering with other ethnicities these are all things that Troy did well. Yeah, blacks too, I, by the way. Yeah, which which I believe New York did not. So I want to kind of pivot a little bit. And I think I think again, you, there's a lot of research more Detroit partnership and so forth. Yourself as, as Gunner, now you are, you know, content creator. You have your show. What did you do? Twelve years in jail, was it? Thirteen. Yeah. Thirteen. So you stood up. You know, you didn't you didn't inform. Um, you know, when you got out, did you kind of recidivate or did you, like, you know, kind of get involved with your old family, your mom, you know, or did you kind of start branching out? And, like, yeah, I, want, I want to get from, like, that point to where you are today and how you got here. Yeah, well, dude, when I went to prison, bro, I, it was over for me, man. I never yeah. wanted to go back to that life ever. To be perfectly honest, I never enjoyed that life. Yes, your highlights where I, I hit, hit a lick. I got 40 grand in my pocket. Let's yeah. go to Miami and pop bottles or whatever. There's a couple yeah. of those, you know. And there was times, but most of the time, you're broke or you're yeah. almost broke. You're chasing dollars. People are chasing you. You're looking over your shoulders. Is that a fed in, the, in my – every car yeah. in the rearview mirror is a cop. You know, every Correct. sound at night is the feds busting in. You can't sleep. By, I mean, it was a freaking nightmare. So when I'm in prison – facing all this time i can finally breathe i'm like finally it's over i'm ready for this to be over and then when i was in the hole when i was in, just sitting in the hole um for 17 months fighting my case i was in the hole um of the 19 months i was fighting my case 17 of them i was in the hole and um that's a long story in itself but i started yeah. reading a lot and i and i started writing i started writing novels in my mind because i'd read books it's funny here's the actually the very first yeah why you, i first. want you to go through because i want because here's the deal guys Gunner puts out a lot of free content. His model is 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 a model I respect. He does it. He's not asking for you know super chats. He's not asking for money. He says, "Here's my products. Here's how yeah. I can eat." But yeah. it's really good product offering value. Yeah. So so why don't you give me your first book? You know, get, walk us through what's available now, and then how we can best support you. I will. Thank you, man. So I just I'll just kind of finish telling you how that went. This yeah. change happened. Yeah. I started writing books and I just, but I didn't have the materials that I could write in prison because I was in the hole, but I started creating in my mind and discovered I had this really good craft for this. Uh, so when I got to prison, um, by the way, this is the very first volume, volume one, this is the first book of my 
first book ever. This is the freaking one. I just spilled yeah. tea on it. Yes, I'm drinking tea. So, <laughs> but anyway, tea, to so tea totaler. <laughs> tea totaler. That's what I am too. I barely drink. But uh, when I was in prison, I started writing, and I didn't. I, I discovered I was very good at it. I started handing. Um, I don't write just mafia books. I didn't even write a mafia book till I was uh, about seven years in, and I think nice. my fifth novel was a mafia. This one to be a king, volume one and two but um and i just started handing these books off to guys that like to read in prison my first one was a, a contemporary sports drama and the second one was um a vietnam war story and the third one was a comedic drama third fourth one was a um suspense thriller yada 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 and then i said i'm gonna write this mafia novel based on my knowledge of that world and yeah. the experience i had in and around i'd never read a mob book still yeah. haven't this is what i did when i was in prison after i wrote this book I did read Sammy the Bull's book, and I read The Last Mafioso by Jimmy Fratiano. Yeah, yeah, that was a good two. book. Yeah, that was both great book. good books. In terms of books, both were good. Yeah, and I enjoyed them, and I was like, wow, these are good. But those are the only two mafia books that I've ever read in my life, and that's it. And I, I read them after I wrote my book. So if you read my book, nobody's going to be like, oh, this guy did a bunch of research and homework and blog searches and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I was in prison, and I'd never read a freaking nothing Hold in my on, life. Let me, let me ask you, what's the biggest difference – between the Sammy the Bull, Frantiano, versus maybe a, a, a Jack Toko. Give, give me the differences between the two. Between Fratiano or, and, and, and well, Sammy. Let's go with Sammy. Let's narrow it down. A Sammy versus Jack Toko. What's the biggest differences between the Sammy the, the Bull is the thug. So that's all he was. And, and he and, in many ways, he was... Um, I say this with a bit of reverence. Um, he was a wannabe. He wanted to be down with the mob real bad, was willing to do anything he could, would do, and he would. He would do it. He was. He's not scared of nothing, and he would yeah. do what he had. The difference between Jack Toka was he was literally the heir apparent. He was mafia royalty. He was groomed yeah. his whole life. Jack Toko has got a, a college degree. He has a bachelor's of science from yeah. in business from the University of uh, U of D, where my mom, every one of my oh, family, wow. U of D Mercy. So here's a guy who's got a business degree, his father was literally the Don, the boss of bosses for like 40 years, and yeah. him and his cousin were, and hands it over to his his, his son, who's yeah. a very groomed, cultured, educated, um, you know, character in itself, and yeah. he knows the Costa Nostra better than Sammy the Bull would ever know it. Here's sure. a guy who not only did he did he follow the rules, but his people made the rules. His yeah. father, his father was sat on the commission. You know, his father, these these are yeah. guys that. It was taught to them, and they take it to death. You'll die before you open your word in presence of a, uh, law enforcement. You die, correct, or, and that's correct. that, and that's correct, it. Correct. And, and they would. Where Sammy felt like he got slighted by God, I mean, uh, Gotti, so he's just like, F it, I'll tell, and I'll tell on everybody else, too. Everybody else, all these freaking guys, they, 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 this is what they did. And that's the difference between Jack Toko. That's the reason why Jack Toko died a free man at 89 years old, worth $100 million, in his mansion in Gross Point, Michigan, raised nine kids, Five of them are doctors, and he's, you know, this guy's, he, he only served 18 months in prison in his yeah. whole life, 90 yeah. years old, 18 yeah. months in prison, died, the FBI valued him at $100 million. That is success. To me, Correct. that is a successful mob tenure. If you're able Correct. to be the boss for 40 years, die worth $100 million, run your ship almost perfectly, you did have one rat, you know, and that, that's and not then, perfect. And then have, and, well, yeah, and, and Nove Toko, what was the relation? Was it a brother? Was it a nephew? Like, and what? that was a nephew of Jack and a cousin oh, okay. of mine. I didn't okay. know him. I only met him in the market a couple times. Didn't know the yeah, guy. Yeah. But I will tell you this, funny story is, I did see him a couple times, and when my uncle said he's he's got his button, I remember looking at him going, this freaking dopey, goofy mother. You know what, dude? Mm -hmm. He reminded me of kind of like a wannabe. Like, he really yeah. put himself out there. I remember when I saw him, he was wearing a track suit, and he was just like trying to act tough, and I'm like, this fat yeah. slob, he ain't tough. I slapped the shit out of this dude. But, you know, he had his button, so everybody was kissing his ass, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. stop projecting it. You know, because most of the Detroit family, they don't have to project it. When they walk in the market, and they got it, they business, got it. Yeah. The people who are supposed to know, they know. They shake sure. your hand, hey, don't go by, that's it. And you don't have to walk in and go, hey, I'm with so-and-so. Hey, I'm with that guy. I'm with that guy. Hey, better know I'm with him. I'm with him now. Hey, you know what I'm doing? I got this crew. They can break legs. You, know, you don't have to do none of that. People just know, you know? Correct. All right. So, to, okay. So, the, the show the book again, if you don't mind. The King, what is okay, it? Okay, yeah. By the right way, back to my, my, my yeah, model. To be so, my, to with be my book. Yeah. So, I decided I'm going to change. I'm not going to go back to that world. I'm going to get out and publish these books. And when I got out, no, I didn't recidivate. I didn't. I said nothing. My, I got out and married my wife who waited for me six years. I met her when I was in prison. 
she found me on you on, on uh, Facebook and saw I was writing. She worked for a publisher. She said I can help maybe, and we started writing. And next thing you know, she waits six and a half years. I marry her the day I get out. I spend the next nine months basically partying, meaning fishing, camping, you know, just having fun. You know, I've been locked up for 13 years. So my family and friends, you know, said, here's money. Here's a life. You don't have to work. Just have fun. Take your time getting your book ready to publish and then publish it. And then shortly after I published the book, it did really well. It shot up into like top 100 in organized crime in like a couple of days and peaked nice. at like number three. It, yeah, it was right next to the Godfather. I got a picture of it sitting next to Godfather. I'm like, oh, I mean, awesome. imagine your book sitting next to the Godfather. And then I lost Art Thing Apparel because the reason for that is I took this cover of this book and put it on a hoodie. I transferred it onto a hoodie. And on the back, I had to say Detroit Art Thing because it's about a Detroit Mafia family. Yeah. So a bunch of people started saying to me, hey, man, I want one of those hoodies with your cover on it. But I'm from New Jersey or, or New York or Miami. And you can get whatever. So the Art Thing and the photo static and the, the city you could put whatever city on, right? Yeah, so you can get whatever city you want. Miami, New York, Philly, whatever. And then this is our logo and then our thing. So whatever city is yours. And the back of every garment, you know, it, it, you know, looks like this tracksuit looks That's like cool. that. But yours might say, uh, where, if you're from New York, yeah. Tom, or wherever you're from. Yeah. And so people started saying, can I get this? Can I get? So I said, yeah. So I made some more designs and people started buying it. I made some more designs. Now we have everything from, from, from leather coats. I mean, I got freaking leather coats right here. This is I got what's, one your, for what's, your, what's your best seller on in terms of merch? Tracksuits. Tracksuits are our best seller. That's cool. But um, like the one I'm wearing right now. Uh, but we sell a lot of t-shirts, hats, hoodies. You know, we got duffel bags, gym bags, backpacks, everything. But, you know, t-shirts sell a lot and hoodies sell a lot. But these tracksuits, which are 150 bucks, but they're custom made. They're going to have your name. You're going to have your name on it. So, like, mine says Gunner okay. and Detroit, our thing. But if you'll have your city, New York, say our thing and on the back. And so that's what I did. And then I got... I just kept pushing my brand, pushing. I uh, said, you know, one time at some point, like, hey, a YouTube channel could help me promote my books. Yeah. So I go out there and you know, promote my books on YouTube. So I started telling stories, these kind of stories from my life before I was in prison, kind of sharing them. And that eventually led to a radio show because yeah. uh, Scott Bernstein got me to radio show. So, I mean, it just kind of it all kind of worked out. But I have 320 some shows on YouTube. And um, they're mostly, I do have interviews and things like that of yeah. people and ex gangsters and people, but most of them are just me telling these crazy ass war stories from the streets. That's it. I love it. So, so, so I'm looking at it like you're creating like a little bit of a media kind of company, if you will. And then you insert merch, insert books. Yeah. Yeah. You know, YouTube video. You have, you have a radio show. And um, it, it, like, what has been the most successful? Like, was it one big show you did or was it? grinding blocking and tackling a little bit along the way you know what is what has been most successful for you so far in terms of selling your stuff i you know that's a great question you ask great questions the, the most yeah. success the most money that i've made from anything is from the apparel um it does well it started making money from day one i've never nice. gone into debt from it I, it's nice. been, i've got a bunch which of is hard money. which is hard to do yeah i know very hard and people are throwing money at it do they want to invest in it the books have made a lot of money too not tons of money but they yeah. they've They've done pretty well. Um, I got a couple things that are really big. Actually, Jordan Harbinger. Do you know who that is? I heard the name, yeah. Jordan Harbinger just asked me to be on his show yesterday. He's a big deal, oh, wow. deal on Sirius Radio. He's got like a $10 million deal on Sirius. But I just got news, and I'm not going to tell you what network it is. Yeah. But a couple of days ago, I got, you know, you, you're in my position. You wait your whole life for that call. Yeah. I got the call. So I now have to just kind of wait it out to see if it comes to fruition. But yeah. the call is a network show with some of the biggest names on the biggest networks. Yeah. The biggest network, the biggest, but I'll give you an idea, figure it out. There's 40 million people watch it. So, I mean, so now I'm sitting there like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. I I'm going deer hunting. I'm heading out to go deer hunting. <laughs> I, get the call. I get a text from the guy, right. It's from this network. And he says, yes, we want to, we're going through, we're going to start filming in February, March. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So if I get on this mainstream show, it's going to be with big names that you all recognize. God um, bless. That it'll be it'll be huge, and obviously my apparel sales will blow up, and my book sales will blow up, and God knows maybe I get a movie deal or something. But I mean, yeah. that all kind of blends together. I'm like you, Tom, man. I'm trying to grind, use my talent and yes. my hard work ethic and my skill set to create a media empire, or just be happy, man. Be successful, and that's it. That's it. Yeah. I'm not here to create drama or yeah. argue or bicker or scam or nothing like that. Like you said, I offer a commodity. I have novels that are, if you read my reviews on my novels, they're all organic and real. If you just go there and read them, most people who don't know this will go there and read the reviews and go, there's no way those reviews are real. They just can't be. I'm like, well, they are. 
read the books. If you don't believe it, I'll send you one myself. I'll pay for it. Just leave the re- leave an uh, 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 honest review when you finish. But that's it. So I have a commodity there, and I have a commodity this. And I, I guess as a personality, I kind of have a commodity. But, um, but yeah, like you. I love it. I'm looking at the site now. So I'm going to drop a link uh, in the comments. It's uh, GunnerDetroit.com. It also, uh, you're able to buy the book. You're able to get um, apparel. And uh, for those, I'm going to put the link below. But for those that are looking for you, Gunner, obviously your name is Gunner Lindblom. But how can they find you on social media? Uh, Gunner Detroit is you, on YouTube. My channel is Gunner Detroit. Um, I, I'm, I'm maxed out of my personal Facebook, but my book to be a King, uh, has its own Facebook page and my, I have an author page, author Gunner Allen Limblum and, and Instagram, the real gun of Detroit. I had to start a new one cause I got hacked and they stole my whole IG. So I just got a new one. And so that, that's it. But YouTube is where to, where to find me at, at Gunner Detroit. And like you said, at Gunner Detroit, my website, there's links to my uh, apparel company, there's links yeah. to my books, there's links to my short stories, links to my radio show, links to everything is there. Well, one of the things I want to point out is in this whole mobosphere, right? Number one is you did not inform. You could have been a much bigger name if you did, you know, and it could have monetized much quicker. You held to your gun. You served the time. So you're the kind of guy that we need to support. I know I have multiple different type of people on, but this is a situation I'm happy to support. I'm going to order some stuff. Cool. Um, I'm going to get the book. I'm going to do a review on it. You have my award and Gunner. Thank you for being on the Arm Trainer NBA, brother. You're welcome, man. Thanks for having me. And uh, I hope I was able to maybe shed a little light on some of the things. Again, I'm not in a race to see who's got the biggest mom or family or who got the whatever. All I can do is give you my own personal insight of experience. From there, you can make your own opinion. And that's all we can ask for.